Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Nicholas Lynch. I'm a consultant and I work with the uh, Institute of Leadership and Management, and I want to welcome you to today's webinar, Ownership, Learning from Mistakes. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Mike Rayner. Mike is a course leader for MSc Sports Management at the University of Portsmouth. He studied his undergraduate and postgraduate degrees at that university and recently completed his PhD entitled The Impact of Professionalization on Rugby Union, Players' Perspectives. His academic career was preceded by extensive operational management and consultancy experience in a range of different public and private sector organizations. Mike, can I hand over to you? Yeah, of course. Thanks, Nick. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, hello and welcome, everybody, to today's session. As uh, Nick introduced, we are going to be doing a session on learning from mistakes. But before we um, go into that into context, we need to sort of put it into the elements of why we're doing this particular webinar. So as you may or may not know, um, we are looking at ownership within the dimensions of leadership, which is part of the leadership and management, um, well, the Institute of Leadership and Management's dimensions of leadership. So um, fundamentally today, we're going to talk about ownership in the context of learning from mistakes. Now, in order to get to the central point of today's webinar, we need to sort of just reaffirm what ownership is in the context of leadership or in context of management. Now, what ownership kind of allows within organizations is the, the very broad term of flexibility and to be introduced into the organizational pattern. Um, in terms of looking at that, you, and specifically in the context of ownership, we need to sort of define the term in order to progress the term into a central narrative. So um, when we look at ownership, we can break it down to three different areas, whether that is responsibility accountability or authority but the problem with looking at these three dimensions on their own within the context of ownership it suggests that there's an element of negativity that is through sort of a mistake and ultimately can create what is known as a blame culture which we will come to um, later on in the actual webinar so now given those three different elements we can now look at ownership as a process of synergizing um, or integrating those three components to create this holistic word of ownership. And whether that is put in a context of learning from mistakes or in the broader narrative in which these two leadership and management are concerned into a range of different um, topics. And specifically, we can see them in a bit of a broader uh, context in this slide. Uh, we can look at problem solving, social responsibility, but for today's purpose, we're going to solely look at learning from mistakes. Now, as Nick introduced, a lot of my um, teaching or in terms of experience is aligned to the sports industry, and specifically sports management in that context. So um, when we go through looking at this context of learning from mistakes from an ownership sort of pathway, a lot of the sort of stuff that I'll talk about will relate back to the sports industry. So if any of you have questions that uh, on the sort of application to more mainstream business, please feel free to ask that towards the question and answer session at the end. But um, my, my, I will try and make it as broad as possible, but do forgive me if the um, narrative sometimes drifts purely into the sports industry. Okay, so when we start looking at learning from mistakes, it gives us the opportunity to, as an individual, as an organization, as a leader, to start reflecting in that self, it's, it allows that personal and organizational reflection upon performance, whether that is a positive progression or it is a negative content in terms of the outcome. OK, but what it does do in terms of our leadership and management is allows us the opportunity uh, to approach reviewing mistakes as an opportunity for learning. And it allows us in our professional guises and our professional bodies to avoid apportioning blame and there are reasons and strategies behind how we can actually do that okay if we go through in terms of the classic definitions of leaders and managers we can even relate originally back to drucker um, doing the right thing or management do things right um, but ultimately when we start looking at any elements of mistakes or any patterns of reflection we go back to those three points that classify what ownership is, responsibility, accountability, authority. And then fundamentally, we can start looking at a process of engaging uh, with 
these elements of mistakes and looking at them in terms of a progressive nature. We try and avoid the negative connotations to what is a mistake, a fail, failed project, a missed opportunity, because we need to avoid this sort of blame culture. We also need to look at how we can evolve and we look at patterns in terms of feedback, and how this can actually occur. So for the next step of this, this webinar, we're going to focus on blame cultures and specifically identifying what exactly that is. Now, as you can see, there's a quote in front of us um, that looks at what a blame culture actually is. And in terms of looking at it from a leadership perspective, it's a way of blaming someone else for the, some individual's fault. OK, um, it's a way of shifting that blame, avoiding having any responsibility for any errors, any mistakes that individuals make. And there's a very classic line there by Mark Murphy when he states it's, it's similar to a magician distracting the audience while they're pulling off the real trick somewhere. Now, I think, you know, I put this in a sporting context. It could be quite simple as a lot of my research works within rugby union. So it could be a fly half, for example, missing a tackle and the team, the opposition team going on to score. And naturally, a fly half would, that's formerly my position within rugby union, would naturally blame the oversight flanker for ha making myself having to make that tackle. And all of a sudden, the accountability I'm passing on to someone else. Similarly, you see it in more um, typical sports such as football, a goalkeeper conceding a goal, instantly standing up and blaming the defenders. That is their fault that the goal was conceded. It wasn't the goalkeeper's fault in that central point. So that's how a blame culture comes about. And in terms of where it fits within this particular seminar, this partic particular narrative, it's a way of sort of dismissing the origins of that mistake, which is not necessarily a good thing from a learning perspective, because we all have to be accountable for our errors, uh, our performance in that sense, whether it's in the sporting guys or in professional organizational guys, because we need to be able to learn. And if a blame culture exists within an organization, it can create a negative connotation and it can have an impact upon subordinates from a leadership perspective or an organizational performance perspective, which is fundamentally the key to that organization's perspective. So if we look at this particular model on the slide right now, and we'll start with the disproportionate punishment for mistakes, okay, in terms of the origins of this blame culture. Within a sporting guise, within a coaching element, this is quite, a, quite an easy sort of example to give in terms of this disproportionate um, punishment for mistakes. A classic, an old school coach could say, well, you missed 100 tackles last week. So this whole training session, you're going to run laps. You're going to keep running and running and running until we forget about the fact that you missed those 100 tackles. Now, if you think about that perspective from a coaching point, well, they're actually not coaching that individual to improve their, their tackling technique, be confident in that sort of situation. And it creates that sort of emphasis where the coach believes that themselves, or an AKA a leader, put everything in place for everything to go well. And something didn't go well, so it's not their fault, it is that subordinate's fault. And actually, they're all part of that process in that kind of context. And similarly, when, when things go right, leaders love to stand up and coaches specifically or captains within a sporting context love to stand up and be accounted. Yeah, that was me. That was all, all my responsibility. I'm the reason for why that particular element went well. And the blame culture just gets shifted through the process. It's any praise they stand up and be counted for, any kind of mistake or error is then just filtered through and punished in disproportionate amount of volume. And that kind of leads in with the style of leadership that's evident within either the typical business environment or similarly within the sports context, because that shift of blame flows quite naturally. Creating a hierarchy means that somebody is standing face forward, but it's their decisions. And the blame culture is just filtering it back so that they don't actually, you know, get stood up and be accountable for their, their sort of causes and consequences towards that situation. And that goes back to that concept with Drucker, that original theory about the leader doing the right thing, management doing things right. And 
it's a, it's a way within business and specifically within sporting context where this disproportionate level of blame or punishment and the opportunity to stand out of a crowd when anything positive comes through, it creates that sort of bullying culture within an environment that has a serious negative effect upon the performance of that organization. And when we look at that, you can look at sporting examples. So you can look at Sir Alex Ferguson and his legendary um, temper tantrums in, in the changing room and the impact that has upon the performance of that team. Players often look to move on if they're not part of that process, if they're not coming out in terms of any positive consequence. Um, and similarly, it's, it's a way has an impact upon the overall performance of that team. And that leads on to the actual consequences of this. And I'll, I'm not going to read these particular, all these components back to you, but I'm going to pick on um, a couple of things just to really emphasize. And you can read uh, the points at your own leisure. So when, when I mentioned Sir Alex Ferguson in terms of um, the temper tantrums in the changing room, um, that, ha that has an opportunity where it creates some element of po positivity within a sporting context, but ultimately it dilutes that blame culture, okay, and creates that within that environment. And what it enables in terms of sport is those players, those professional athletes to lose focus within their sort of context of their reality. And consequently, they start looking at their own self-preservation. And you can see the stories, I'm talking in the 90s, early 2000s, uh, of players being on the wrong side of those temper tantrums. And then all of a sudden, their agents are touting their availability to move. And there are all those legendary stories about Yapstam or David Beckham moving on as a consequence because they're looking at their self-preservation because it's their industry, their trade that is at stake. So that blame culture has an opportunity, it has a really strong impact upon the organization in a very negative context, okay? And similarly, what it does in very sort of creative type organizations or uh, particularly within the sports in, um, or industry, it dilutes anyone's level of empowerment for creativity. People avoid taking risks. They avoid putting themselves in a position where they could be on the receiving end of that blame culture. And what that ultimately does is dilutes the product, the service, the actual overall value of what they're trying to do within their work environment. And that doesn't necessarily flow well for the future of that organization. So a blame culture is particularly a negative sort of element towards what we're looking at in terms of learning from mistakes. And we need to try and avoid that. But the, I guess the magic question is, what can a leader do about a blame culture? And you can see there's a nice neat model in, in front of you that sort of outlines the procedural process of what a leader can do in terms of uh, managing, controlling, avoiding the element of a blame culture. So obviously for the first context is to avoid blaming others for, for your own mistakes. As a leader, you put yourself in a position where you design strategy, make those vital decisions that have to be followed, okay? And that Drucker theory, okay, when we look at leadership and uh, management, doing the right thing. Now, if you do a self-reflection, which is the concept of looking at ownership in that sense, is blaming someone else for your own mistakes the best example to set in terms of that personal evaluation as well as an organizational evaluation and similarly as you progress through this particular model on the slide you start to see there's a strong emphasis on feedback so giving constructive feedback rather than necessarily blaming the emphasis is changing the tap okay something hasn't gone quite well but what can we do to improve it and i guess that's a something that I've really experienced in terms of rugby union, my experiences, my engagement within rugby union specifically, and particularly looking at the British and Irish Lions. If any of you are a particular fan of the British and Irish Lions in a rugby context, just try and find yourself some YouTube clips of Warren Gatlin um, reporting on the performance of a team after a fixture on either a tour to South Africa, Australia, or New Zealand in the recent years. He's very clever to not assert a blame culture throughout his team. 
obviously it's a bit of a condensed environment. It's a six week professional athlete tour. But his response is always about how the team can learn, whether they have beaten a team by a significant score, whether the game has been tight, whether certain elements of their teamwork didn't quite gel at that moment in time. Warren Gatland is very um, clever in terms of his speaking with the media, but similarly on how he addresses the players in the behind closed doors environment. He focuses on progression. He has a collaborative approach and it's all about feedback and a very clever thing in which I have noticed within that environment is that whilst individuals have their own you can imagine elite performance uh, data analysis performance analysis strength conditioning so on and so forth Warren Gatlin is very clever to start working in pods starting to look at the overall organizational performance of that actual team and he'll group the halfbacks together the back row the second row the front row for example just so that they're always focusing on learning together because within that environment cohesiveness is key and so when we look at this blame culture and the eradication of it kind of focuses on always that learning that learning process and obviously at some point sets rewards and in in those particular environments it could be a night off it could be some some sort of comical um tour procedure that they instill which is classic to rugby union in its history um but it's a very clever way of looking at what the work of warren gatlin does within a professional sport environment how it can be applied so avoiding that blame culture looking at procedures for feedback but always in that positive learning guise and that links quite neatly into Kolb's learning or experiential learning cycle, where in order to get thorough constructive processes in terms of avoidance of blame culture and kind of learning from those mistakes, Kolb's learning cycle in this environment suggests those, those experiences need to happen in order to the progression for that organization, for that individual. And the concrete experience element of this model is going through that exact process okay um and then we move through through the model it goes right to left in a circular motion and we go to reflective observation and it kind of uses this theory in terms of Kolb's model the re reflection and particularly mistakes is the best sort of teaching an individual could have going wrong but knowing how to correct where they went wrong in a sales strategy pitching the right component to the right audience not focusing on elements of a particular product or service that's kind of peripheral to the central interest in an audience. When we move through, we go to generalizing. It's kind of understanding that dynamic. So in terms of looking at rugby and performance, playing, say, the All Blacks, not particularly having a great experience, which accounts for most people who play in rugby union against the All Blacks, most teams, I would say. Looking at where they went wrong individually, um, within their work groups or similarly as a team and actually making sense of it. OK, so how do we put this together? How can we improve in our next fixture or the next environment? And that moves through in terms of applying that sort of active experimentation. So it needs to sort of allow the immediate context. Sport is very fortunate in this environment because there's always the next fixture. There's always the next competition. And so they have a very sort of immediate opportunity to remedy any mistake that was made from that concrete experience and go through this reflective cycle. But whatever the environments that you're interested in, work with it. This work basically illustrates and should demonstrate that any mistake needs to be reviewed, evaluated and sort of built upon in a very urgent and sort of immediate fashion. And so that kind of creates what we know as the learning organization. And you can see Alan Mumford's particular quote in front of you in terms of understanding these experiences, evolving from these experiences, allows individuals, organizations on which to grow. OK, and to do that, you know, we, we talked about that very beginning model about learning from mistakes. So we've talked about blame culture and the avoidance of blame culture. We're looking at that experiential learning demonstrated through Kolb's model. But similarly, now we start looking at this feedback moment, this feedback opportunities to start looking and progressing ourselves within this environment. Um, so obviously, feedback identifies that gap that exists between 
expectations, achievements, mistakes, errors, and reality. In terms of from, uh, working at it from a leadership perspective, um, feedback actually shows you care about your subordinates, care about the elements in which they haven't done quite so well, and kind of understanding and pushing them through, through target measures um, and opportunities to listen, and how they can progress. And most importantly, working collectively in setting the next sort of sequence and targets. And classically, when we start looking at the framework for feedback, it's important to go through these sort of three core elements. And that is the purpose of that feedback, the actual timely nature of that feedback, and being able to create feedback regularly in that context. Now, as I said about sport, sport is very immediate. So feedback is very instant high pressure, the immediacy of week in, week out performance in the public eye um, signifies that, you know, there is a purpose, there's a rationale in terms of understanding and developing that feedback. It has to be fairly immediate because the next game is just around the corner. But it can't be too overly over the top. You need to sort of make sure it's frequent, make sure it's consistent. It doesn't just drop on a player's sort of lap all of a sudden. And within these elite professional environments, they have processes and procedures that they go through these three, three sequential processes. And uh, the slide in front of you is kind of a, a tip guide in terms of how to give constructive feedback, in terms of preparation, looking at that one-to-one -one relationship. Remember, I'm going to re-emphasize Drucker's theory in terms of the value of leaders or the role of leaders in comparison to managers. Um, so it is that one-to-one, -one, that relationship that allows the avoidance of blame cultures, allows familiarization with the working staff, um, because it also allows the leader, leader sorry, to be specific. Okay, And it creates an, a fact-based conversation, not opinion. And it creates elements of a conversation where there is positive moments as well as progressional moments, avoiding that blame culture. And sport is a very neat process for this because of the need and importance to avoid blame in terms of the leadership component of the sports industry. That process of purpose, timeliness and regularity of feedback um, allows input from subordinates, players, however you look at it in your particular industries in terms of how they feel they could improve. Um, but ultimately, in a position of authority, you need to provide that support. You need to give that realistic um, gender setting, object setting, in order that goals can be achieved and lessons can be learned if they're not achieved. So you can see the slide in front of you about the importance of feedback. Um, there is a slight problem with in terms of Overly frequent feedback, okay? It stifles staff, gets them sort of constantly sort of responding to events rather than taking initiative to go on their own way. But what feedback does do, it allows them to empower themselves and learn from their own mistakes, which if you have constant feedback, it kind of devalues that. It becomes more of a monitoring process rather than what feedback is designed to do. So the three processes we previously talked about, purpose, timeliness, and regularity, are fundamental in terms of getting this right. Because within elite sport and business, the actual focus is the same. The focus on empowerment with innovation, it's highly priced and sort of valued by both firms and sporting organizations alike because feedback avoidance of blame culture and learning from any particular mistakes is key to organizational design uh, organizational uh, survival and fundamentally um it's kind of the empowerment positivity of a work environment for the staff um, so in terms of that process of feedback the final bit really for me is just to ensure there's always that follow up process as a leader, making sure you're reflecting on that improvement, making sure it is happening without overly doing the feedback, looking at it from an organizational, a leadership perspective and adjusting targets, working with subordinates, working with sporting context players accordingly to make sure that it happens. And obviously within any sort of component of 
feedback, documenting all conversations so that there is measurable evidence of progression. Because ultimately, when we sort of learn from mistakes, we need to avoid that blame culture. We need to ensure that experiential learning takes place and that this feedback that we've just briefly talked about is constructive in nature. So just to conclude, there's a quote there from Peter Honey um, that suggests feedback is an essential part of learning. Maybe it's an overstatement, but it's almost true to say no feedback, no learning. OK, that is me. There's some references for a future read. Mike, many, many thanks. We've just got time for a couple of questions. Um, the, the first one's around you, you talked to, as you said, all your examples came from the sporting uh, sort of world. Um, do you think that the there's a, a real difference in terms of um, the way that businesses view these things and the way that sport does. And I think here particularly around, as you said, there's always a next game in sport. Yeah, There's a very clear sort of timeline and you've got the next challenge and you've got very clear, I either won or lost. I, I either won or lost that game. And, and, and I just wonder if you could reflect on how that, whether that's a different sort of environment or what the differences are in the business sort of context. Yeah, it's, it's a good question in that context, because actually they are very similar. Whilst it's obvious in the public eye that a next fixture, next competition is a very immediate in the sporting industry. Actually, within the business industry, there are immediate targets just the same, whether that is the weekly performance target in terms of finance, monthly, quarterly bills. There is a constant drive to improve, perform, achieve. And sport just happens to do it in the public eye. But I actually think the kind of experiences, the positivity, the processes which sport undertakes is very applicable to the actual uh, mainstream business industry in that sense. Uh, following on from that, I think, is, and you, you did talk about this, but so we want feedback, but we also want, in, want people to be innovative. Yeah, we want our staff to be innovative and take on challenges and come up with ideas and I just wondered if you could uh, reflect a little bit about you know when does feedback become monitoring and and stifle that innovation when does it become um you know almost so constant that people really feel that it's uh, oppressing them yeah again it's a good question because feedback is fundamental but over feedback is kind of becomes more agenda setting and target setting yeah, rather yeah. than the nature of feedback and feedback's meant to be in the process an individual review so working with the leader and subordinates to make sure that values and targets are a joint decision rather you know an overly sort of um authoritarian approach to it is this you know feedback becomes targets and that's that's something that needs to be avoided it has to be realistic on both personal goal that people get employed for certain reasons and have chose that organization in which to apply. But similarly, within industry, what the targets have to be achieved. And that's only sort of measured within independent industries. It's only being able to do that. Sport, for example, they have that obvious next game. So they need to have feedback on that performance for that next game. And it works in different areas for sport because there's strength and conditioning. There's a range of different elements of a sport elite performer's environment that impact upon that next performance. So they get feedback quite regularly in terms of understanding that feedback. But similarly, there's a very fine line between what they having to have as an individual before team target setting comes into that. And it's, it, it's a very sort of unique industry led sort of question in that sense. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm afraid we're out of time, Mike. Um, I'd just like to thank you for for taking us through your presentation and for uh, an, uh, answering our, our questions. And I wish everyone a happy, well, a happy day, a happy af afternoon, happy evening. Thanks very much. Take care. Bye bye. Thanks.